is only talking about protecting those rights instead of enhancing those rights. And I think that was a very important um, you know, failure of the Labour Party because it also demonstrated that, that politicians in general are not going to fight to enhance working conditions and probably will go to, 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 to type once this, this uh, pandemic is concluded by using the opportunity to reduce terms and conditions for most of us in our workplace and weakening legislation uh, that, that, that protects so many in the workplace. So I would argue at this moment in time, what we should be doing is re, refocusing on, on our aims and objectives and demanding still, you know, that 15 pound an hour is paid to every worker, demanding still the abolition of zero hours contracts and demanding still, you know, that, that we, we, we continue to fight uh, against the inequalities by, by ending uh, the youth minimum wage. Because if we take a step backwards, all they will do is march forwards. So I, I think despite the, the, the pressures that we're gonna come under, I don't think now is the time for us to retreat. I think we've got to march forward and we've got to do that collectively. And it's organizations like People Before Profit that will highlight how, how, how the wealthy have put their, 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 uh, their interests above ours and how we make sure that we get our arguments into those workplaces is, is the key to be able to organize um, and make sure that when we do come out of this, we come out of it stronger, more determined, and in a, in, a, in a better place to win in our workplaces. And, and that means winning in our communities too. So thank you very much for the invitation. Thanks very much, Ian, that was brilliant. Um, and yeah, and I think the, you know, the figures that came out this week on occupations, which were horrific for workers, are a massive underestimate of the number of workers that have died. And it also doesn't reflect the number of, work, uh, number of family members that have, been, that have contracted the virus as well from those workers. And probably some of those have died as well. So because of because they haven't got in place the proper test trace in place or the proper records of the number of people who died. So yeah, absolutely. If we take a step forward, step backwards, they will take a step forward. So we've got to take a step forward. And I think that should be what comes out of tonight. So um, and one of the groups that are taking a step forward uh, that we're really pleased to have join us tonight is the uh, British Gas Worker Striker is Kev Burns, who's now a nominal Lancaster Lancastrian, no, <laughs> Lancashire person. <laughs> Over to you, Kevin. Thanks, John. Thanks for uh, inviting me on tonight. Um, it, it's, uh, it's, it is really important to uh, report what's going on at British Gas um, because Ian's, Ian's just alluded to it now. I think, I think we're getting to the point of being, being in a class war here. Um, and, and our dispute is, 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 is right in the middle of that. Um, what this dispute's about is the company have proposed to change our terms and conditions to much, much, much reduced uh, set of terms and conditions uh, under the threat of fire and rehire. For us, it's not about extra paying conditions, nothing like that. Uh, we're, we're even willing to make concessions. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's just a simple demand from the GMB union and the British Gas Workers for Chris O'Shea, our chief executive, and the company, to remove the threat of fire and rehire, come back to the uh, negotiating table and enter into meaningful and constructive talks, which up to this point hasn't happened. Um, and, 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 he's, and he's, again, Ian alluded to this as well about the, the, the cover of the pandemic. He has absolutely used the cover of the pandemic to try and force these changes through. But more than that, he's used the cover of one of the most right-wing governments that we've ever had. You know, the, let, let's 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 not let's let, let's not uh, skirt around that fact. It's becoming clear now that this is a coordinated plan uh, to lower paying standards with Boris Johnson and his, his millionaire mates and, and and you know Chris O'Shea and you know characters like this. Um, but I'll tell you this, they picked on the wrong workforce this time um, because our collective is is one of the biggest in terms of numbers. But over the last few weeks, it's shown itself to be one of the best in terms of solidarity. Now I've been proud of the campaign we've run and proud to stand shoulder to shoulder with these uh, with the British gas strikers some have never known before and you know we're becoming good friends and uh, and you know we are a force to be we're becoming a force to be reckoned with I wouldn't want to be on the other side of it I tell you that um, and you know we didn't choose to be on the front line of what has essentially now become a class war we were provoked by British gas um, they fabricated the reasons around it 
and then they provoked us into it. Um, but you know what? We've got broad enough shoulders to lead this line and, and we've got big enough hearts to, to hold the line as well. And that's exactly what we're going to do. You know, we've got a good tradition at British Gas uh, of stepping up in times of adversity. You know, whether it's a eye water and storm or, or, or a life-threatening pandemic, which we're in now, you know, as key workers, we, we've met those challenges head on and we're, gonna, we're, we're certainly going to meet this challenge as well. You know, I, like I say, the, the campaign we, we run has been wonderful. You know, the, the support we've had from yourselves and from the public, politicians, it's, it's been brilliant, overwhelming. And it, it, we've run a, a really positive campaign as well, in stark contrast to the, um, to the campaign that we've been subjected to in work of bullying and harassment to try and demoralise us and frighten us and, and get us to sign this contract. But, you know, so, so I'm asking you tonight just to finish off, really, is just to keep that support going. You know, we've seen that support on the picket line and the engineers, and you know, you know more importantly, we've felt that support. And it really has, it, it really has kept us going. So, you know, we can win this, uh, but we, we need you by our side. So just want to finish with one word, solidarity. Solidarity, Kevin. That was, that was brilliant. And, you know, you have our full solidarity from this loose coalition that in front of you, but also from all the organisations, I'm sure, that these people represent. And whatever we can do to support you and to, to help you, then please let us know. Uh, and we'll certainly be there standing next to you if we can, and certainly virtually, absolutely. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. You know, this is a class war that, we've, that we're fighting. And the fact that these, these companies are uh, using this, this time when we're facing one of the most traumatic times, you know, the most horrific times, the, the pandemic, to do under the cover of that, I think, is just shows, shows them all up like, you know, for what they really are. Uh, and whatever we can do to support you, we will be there with you. So thank you very much. So our next speaker is um, Sunil uh, Banger, who's the president of the UCU at Lancaster University. And he's, you know, UC, the universities and schools, you know, the education um, places have been at the forefront of many of the, um, uh, of the pan in the pandemic, facing some real, con real uh, issues. Uh, and uh, at the university is going to speak about the face-to-face -face teaching ballot that they've just had um, and solidarity with the students as well. So over to you, Sunil. Thanks very much, Janet, and thanks for the invite. Uh, first of all, solidarity to British gas workers and to sister unions on this call. Um, I just wanted to talk about what's going on in the university sector, simply because uh, it's not just staff and students who are being put at risk, but I think what's happening with the management actions is putting our wider community in Lancaster at risk. Uh, the university is a big employer and people come in and out of the university every day. And the, the failure of the management to minimize that, that um, presence on campus has led to lots of issues and mainly because of the, their insistence on face-to-face -face teaching. So what's been going on is, I mean, COVID has exposed the ugly underbelly of the university system the way the marketized model has worked has gaslighted students, uh, put staff at a breaking point. And I've never seen such catastrophic management failure in, in all my years in the UCU. Um, it's disaster capitalism at its best. And as Kev was saying, this government is doing nothing to help. The most useless government we have seen. Um, and there are job cuts now going on everywhere in universities um, that they're trying to save money. And this is happening <laughs> ironically in the, in the university sector, which has risen magnificently to fight COVID, you know, in terms of the research, forming the backbone of the scientific advice which the government gets. And then they choose to ignore that advice. Um, so uh, locally, we have entered into this dispute with management last week on Friday. We balloted our members on the insistence to, uh, on, of management to teach face to face. Um, but that's just one aspect of our ballot. The other part of the ballot is their handling of health and safety issues. We had lots of issues on campus, which probably haven't been brought into the public domain and have not been made visible because the university management has tried to suppress those issues. Um, so we are we have balloted our members on two things. One is uh, obviously face-to-face -face teaching, which is putting communities at risk. 
and the other is on health and safety and workload issues. 75% of our members have said that they'll take strike action. Um, and uh, we are now in the process of organizing a statutory ballot. That was an indicative ballot which we have done. And hopefully on Monday, Tuesday, we're going to launch the, the statutory ballot to take strike action. Um, and just to close, um, what actions can, can workers or trade unions take? Um, I think our campaign has been basically on three things. One is we have advised our members of Section 44 of the Employment Relations Act, um, following NEU's <laughs> advice and guidance, uh, which allows workers to leave the premises. And that's been kind of successful to a certain extent in giving our members some confidence that they don't have to be forced into this thing. Um, but interestingly, we have also taken legal advice uh, we have taken legal advice from Lee Day, a barrister firm in, in London. And the advice makes very clear. Uh, the reason I'm mentioning this is because we focus on government and we kind of almost let senior management um, go scot-free, but they are equally responsible for what's going on. And the legal advice which we have received says that senior managers, by their actions or omissions, if they cause a COVID infection on campus, which results in illness or death, they, they are potentially liable for prosecution. So we are now exploring the possibility of taking a case out against the university. Um, and if anyone is interested in that legal advice, I'll be very happy to share that paper. Um, just contact me directly or let Janet know and I'll forward that advice. Uh, but the, the most important thing, the most important way, like other speakers have said, we can fight back is through collective action. I would urge people to join a union now. I've seen the sign, Janet. Thanks, I'll finish. Um, yeah, uh, join a union. Let's collectively fight this. Government in action and bosses are not going to listen. Um, and uh, it's only our, through a collective action that we can win. Thanks. Thank you very much. And again, solidarity with your members at uh, the university. And it's really good to see a, a, a big uh, indicator ballot, indicator ballot, and let's hope it follows through to the to the ballot and I think that's right I think we've our employers are not understanding or are they ignoring the fact that if we have transmissions in the workplace infections in our workplaces then that's going to go back into our communities to our families and the communities so they are they are raising the transmission in our rates in our communities by not controlling those and you know it's very clear to us in health and safety terms is that we shouldn't be on site working if you can do it from home. I mean, that was the advice that we got. And it certainly is the first step in controlling the risks. And so it's a nonsense that they are putting people at risk and putting our communities at risk as well. So anything that we can do to support you, Sunil, that would be really much appreciated. And, and I would like a copy of your legal um, uh, decision, you know, the legal judgment. To yeah, sure, I'm happy to send it to you. Thank you very much. Um, so our next speaker is Tina Rothery, uh, who's also, you know, central in uh, Lancashire, she's a campaigner in Lancashire, climate campaigner, um, and she's going to be speaking about the need to cooperate across divides and the possibilities for online and offline protests under COVID and the urgent need for action. So over to you, Tina. Hi, thanks so much, Janet. It was interesting because what Kev, Kevin Sunil both was speaking about just really highlighted what I was thinking, which is that, you know, there are there are legal ways to fight things and financial ways. And it's very strange as an activist after so long using my body in front of a truck to make a bad thing stop to suddenly be being locked in and unable to you know, actually make an impact. And I attend Zoom meetings like I'm sure all of you do. And we keep learning, sadly, more and more of the pain and the anguish that we can see has come about as a result of 10 years of austerity, putting us in the worst possible situation to face a crisis of this magnitude. And not just the crisis of the virus, but Brexit and, and the harms or the changes and the adaptation that's going to require. And then quietly lurking in the background, the climate crisis too. But on the virus, which I suppose is our main focus, because every day we can actually see and witness the deaths and what we can see, which is the perverse other side, is the opportunism of governments. The fact that they have taken this crisis, not treated it as the emergency it is, but taken every opportunity to take an 
chance of making profit for someone who's in their favor. And it's a sickening state, but the only, if you said there was a bonus to 120,000 deaths and a clearly corrupted government, it's a, there are so many people who can see that now, that perhaps in our complacency and that for large chunks of the population that we're in an okay place, you know, life has become far harder. There's grieving all about people. Most of us know someone impacted and the loss of finance and stability and certainty is affecting mental health of everyone across the nation. The fact that people are having to deal with their own children has perhaps made them respect teachers more or understand that teaching is not that damned easy and that therefore just sending your kid off is not is, is not the only way to raise a child and that at a home you've got to do that too. So I think that one of the reasons I wanted to speak tonight was that I think one of the things holding us in stasis, you, know, you look at, we've had some success. So you look at Rolls Royce, school meals, the reopening of schools, those things were turned around by masses of people actually making such a concerted effort, but really mainly online, you know, we don't have that physical ability anymore. So how do we utilize online more to get results, not just to share and inform? And I looked at a story unfold today that I found really interesting, although it's not related to this, sorry. It's a company called GameStop in America, and it's a big gaming company, um, but well, not that big, but they have retail stores. And this, they were um, hedge funds as usual, were betting that they would fail because all retail is failing. So hedge funds are seizing the opportunity to clean up whilst you know high street retailers are going on their ass and staff are losing jobs. But they decided to fight back and they fought back by gathering 2.8 million people through Reddit and investing, which took the share price from $4 to $268 and caused a near bankruptcy of the hedge fund that was worth 13 billion. So I watched it unfold and I recall what we did in, in the anti-fracking movement. We quite often played a financial activism, you know, where you take a business that is bad and you encourage some way of making sure that they financially are hit because we know deep down that's what drives the worst in society. So it's how to do that and how to impact. But when Sunil said they are doing a legal action, that too, you see the success that that could have, that maybe our bodies on the streets wasn't all we needed. What we really needed was to be working across our differences and focusing on one issue at a time, because that's what I'm finding so challenging too. And I look to people like say XR, People Before Profit and all of the other groups all over the place who are trying to act and pull people together to have power almost like unions do. But how do we amalgamate all of us together? And I wonder if we don't do that by limiting the sign up, like quite often I'll want to support a group, but they want more than the one thing I'm supporting. They want a multitude of things as well and that perhaps there would be some way that we could focus with people before profit, because it's so the perfect title that covers almost all of our issues, to tackle together one issue at a time. And I, I don't know how we do that, but I think the people before profit is possibly that central point where we could trust the activists behind it and the people organizing it to say, right, this is what we need and this is what we need now. So when Sunil does his legal action, let us know. And then we go across all of our different networks to make sure that that's the biggest thing we can get out, at least on the internet and to all the contacts we have. And also we're all connected to others who may have key skills we can bring to each other's fight. I just suppose what I'm really looking for and what I'm hoping comes with people before profit is that we find that central meeting place where we can bring ourselves together. Because I think that there's only so long we can, I don't know what to do with the rage that's inside me now that I can't stand in front of a truck. I don't know where to put that because each day you're seeing workers suffer. You're seeing people suffer because they can't be with their relatives who are dying purely because the government didn't invest in PPE, didn't invest in backup services, didn't fulfill the obligations it has to us as a nation. And I don't know how we tackle that when we haven't got an election other than you know rising up together and making as big a fuss as we can. But online noise is not enough. It needs to result in financial harm or legal consequence. And I think that's maybe how we need to start 
accepting that the way we are as activists needs to change. And I'm not quite sure what that looks like, but I'm hoping that there's enough bright minds in the world that we come up with those ways, you know, and seeing that, you know, complete another slam dunk and it only took them a week to bring down a huge hedge fund company from destroying a retail premises. You know, that was an amazing feat and it, and it gave me some hope that we could actually do more. And the same with when we saw with Rolls Royce and the um, school meals. So I, I, that was really it. I, I just wanted to say that I think that we need to have more faith in a central point, unite together, bring our different arguments in together, not discuss the politics or which party we are and try to focus on one issue at a time and find a legal or financial way of doing real harm. That's Thank you so much. Yeah, that was brilliant, Tina. And I think it puts into words some of the things that we're all thinking. You know, we brought together the two organisations uh, that are uh, campaigning at the moment, you know, the People Before Profit and Zero Covid. And I think that's, you know, some of the, the reasoning behind that is that we should be working together on issues uh, rather than all separating out. And I think, you know, there, there's some really good ideas there that we need to we need to look at and that focusing on one one issue at a time and how you can maximise our impact. I think it's a really interesting concept. And I think I just add that, you know, like during election time when we were having the anti-fracking movement, but it was really important for us that we didn't get split up by some being Labour or, you know, Liberal or Conservative. We still, oh, or, oh no, there was none of them. Uh, Green, we needed to still stick together. Yeah. And so we kind of took away the political conversation where we could, don't bother. Let's just do that on your own time. Deal with this one issue. We agree this thing must stop. And we will stand together until we stop it. And that's how one dance together. And, and that's it. And I probably have nothing else Thank to do you. with one other <laughs> Thank you so much, Tina. Uh, I'm sure we'll come back to this on the in the discussion. So our next, quickly moving quickly on to Andy Cunningham, who's the NAU uh, workplace activist. And he's going to speak about the fantastic campaigns that have been fought in schools um, and fighting for collectively for safe workplaces. And it's a campaign that's going to continue for a long time to come, I think in terms of the way that the government are handling the school situation. So over to you, Andy, you need to unmute. Yeah, thanks very much, Janet. Um, when Ian started, he talked about that 100,000 death um, sort of milestone that we reached yesterday. And it, it, I think it's important to keep that in mind because that's really what, what we're all kind of doing here. It, that huge sort of problem that we're dealing with where you almost you check that it pops up on your phone every day, those daily deaths. and it feels kind of normal now, but it's definitely not. It's definitely not normal for 1,700 people to die every day. And in that same um, sort of briefing, Boris Johnson said about that he couldn't couldn't have done any more, that he made all the decisions that he could do at the time. And we've all lived it. We know that's rubbish, okay? It's, it's complete, well, I mean, I, I can't really say it um, here, especially as we record it, but it's just complete rubbish. So we started in September with the reopening of schools, knowing uh, that schools were a key vector of transmission. It took till Monday, the 4th of January for Boris Johnson to admit that to everybody. And I don't think, and I, I, you know, I don't think anybody here would necessarily think that he would have done that had it not been uh, for the collective campaign uh, that the a NEU kicked off that weekend before schools went back after Christmas. Okay, um, So all through autumn, when we were seeing rates in schools go up, uh, numbers of kids being off go up, and the first secondary schools uh, and then secondary and primary school age children being the key infectious groups in society. And um, he kept claiming there was no problem at all, even using um, the COVID Act to outlaw schools, going to rotors or shutting early or trying to find ways uh, to keep people safe. Those statistics that happened over Christmas were shocking. So when you see sort of one in 17 uh, secondary school aged children in London had the virus on Christmas day, uh, when they can reasonably be expected to be seeing people in their family, it's just ridiculous. And so that prompted the use of those section 44 letters um, that were kind of instrumental in shutting down schools and forcing this uh, national lockdown. But it's important to say that in reality, that wasn't about the use of that legal framework it was about collective power in schools up and down the country where people got together and they used that sort of um, battle cry really from, from the national leadership and used Section 4, 44 as a tool to force their local managements to shut. And it was clear that closing 
so many schools down on the Monday with what forced him uh, to close them all on Monday night and eventually uh, put us into a, another lockdown. But we know we know what's going to happen now because it's already happened twice in this pandemic. Um, this lockdown isn't good enough. You all, I'm sure if you've all been out in your daily exercise or some of you are still going to work, there are people all over the place. And I, you, you can't believe um, the sort of work that's deemed essential uh, this time around. It was, it was weak enough uh, in spring 2020 in the lockdown. Uh, but this time, what bosses deem essential is that you're coming in and making a profit for them. Um, so what that means is there's more and more transmission out there in the community. We've also got the, the key element of uh, fighting the pandemic, the testing and tracing and isolate system. It's not up to scratch. I mean, they openly talk about that on the news now, that it's not up to scratch. And you can see with this, this contrast where we have with countries like New Zealand, where they had their first case of community transmission in three months, and the entire, thanks to it, uh, the entire trace and isolate system went around trying to find all of the contacts of one woman. Uh, how, you couldn't even start to do that with the levels of the virus that we have in this country today. Um, so I, I can predict what's going to happen. They're going to try and reopen schools while the levels of the virus are too high. And we're going to need um, to oppose that school by school, community by community again, uh, in order to keep everybody safe. And that's where it comes to the alternative and the zero COVID strategy. It's the only way really that we can stop unnecessary death in this pandemic. And that means campaigning locally and nationally to win the argument. We need to make that argument for zero COVID the common sense argument in our communities and in our workplaces. But it also means getting together in all of your workplaces and being uncompromising on safety. What I've found in, in this pandemic is there's whole new layers of people that maybe wouldn't necessarily do anything over wages or whatever, or haven't, don't have a history of trade unionism. Um, that will absolutely, because this is a matter of life and death and a matter of safety for them and their communities, uh, come into activity around this. Uh, so it's about being uncompromising and being bold in workplaces up and down the country. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, thanks very much, Andy. And I think you've made some really important points there. You know, we should be following, we need our government to follow a zero COVID strategy. That's got to be uh, an aim at this point in time. Um, but, I, but absolutely not compromising on safety in our workplaces. We need our workplaces not to be transmitting the virus because that's only adding to what's going on in the communities. And so that, uh, you know, what we'd say is a COVID safe, we need COVID safe workplaces only open at this point in time. And, you know, that uh, we don't get to, and that means putting health and safety as paramount in our workplaces. So thanks very much, Andy, for that. Um, and our final speaker tonight is uh, Greg Flores who's a student rent strike at Lancaster University. I just said that some of the some of the campaigns that young people have been fighting in universities has been inspirational. And it's really good to have you join us tonight, Greg. Over to you. Thank you so much, Janet, and thank you for everyone. Sort of amazing speeches from a whole range um, of different workplaces and society. So I think to begin with, it was sort of obvious that uni management were being exploitative from the beginning. As a first year, um, moving over to campus, a lot of people had to self-isolate and so they couldn't go out and buy food. So the university offers students um, nearly 18 pounds per day food parcels, um, which is just unbelievable. Um, it's unbelievable, it got to like um, different news outlets. The Labour Club organized a student run uh, food parcel service. So, you know, people could be fed and, you know, didn't have to be completely exploited. Now, in terms of a rent strike, we were planning to do a rent strike come the third term because uni management have voted, well, they voted in the first term to increase rent strikes, no, in, to increase rent by 1% on campus for next year. Um, rent as a whole has increased by over 60% in the last 10 years, I believe. Um, so the situation on rent as it stood before COVID-19 uh, was just pretty exploitative. And this was clear to us. So we are planning a rent strike come the third term. But then with the announcement of lockdown, uh, we very quickly got together a letter, uh, got together social media and started the rent strike and started campaigning. And by around two weeks, we almost got around about a thousand rent strikers. Uh, the student union came out in massive support of us. And the main reason being that it was pretty uh, clear to everyone, to, especially the students and the student union, 
that what the university was doing by forcing us to pay a rent for a room we're not going to be in was completely ridiculous. And it was a case in which university really was putting profit before students and before people. So in terms of looking to the future now, we've had a meeting uh, this week with the uni management. Um, and the result is uni management are sort of are fully aware that they're going to have to make more concessions. So far, they've offered a £400 um, voucher, I guess you could say. So you pay your rent full for this term, and the next term they take away £400. Um, but we still go, we're still going strong with the rent strike because it's, that's not enough. <laughs> that's, barely, that's, barely for, that's barely a month for most, for most people. And most of us are probably going to be away for more than a month. So as it stands, we're very hopeful. And we have, you know, amazing, amazing numbers and amazing um, platforms like this one, where we can really spread our message. Um, and I think this is an opportunity also where a lot of students have become radicalized, where they've seen clearly the way in which uni management um, are behaving, but also that collective action is very much a useful and um, powerful tool um for the betterment you know of our situations so uh, thank you for hearing for listening to me um solidarity to everyone and uh, take care thank you thanks very much gregory and it's really good to hear that you're uh, not uh, stepping back on your action when you've got them moving forward and i think that's uh, um I've got them moving back. You're moving forward when they're moving back, I think is the is what was Ian was saying earlier. So I think that's uh, absolutely great and inspirational. And you know, whatever we can do to support you and to give you platforms, we will continue to do so. Thanks very much. Right. Um, I'm going to open it up now to the floor. Uh, if anybody wants to make a contribution, if they can indicate, um, and if you can keep your contribution short so we can get as many people in as possible and maybe be able to. Uh, and if any of the speakers wants to come in again, you know, just to give a quick uh, answer to anything that comes up, then please just indicate us as well. Uh, so our first speaker is um, Larry. Larry, you're on mute. If you started speaking. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Um, I've never seen anything like this before. I mean, none of us have. I mean, not just not only the pandemic, but the scale of the rent strike at Lancaster University, the fact that this is happening across dozens of universities, the fact that there's a ballot for action at both UCLan and Lancaster University over different things, the fact that the gas workers on strike might soon be joined by the telecom workers on strike in the, in the CWU and numerous other groups, we're all facing a pay, a pay freeze. There's been nothing like this before and really there's two logics you know we're marking this grim moment of a hundred thousand deaths and this is because the government have pursued quite predictably a profit before people strategy at every turn and so this is this is exactly the result and we've but we've also seen that it was the working class through the collective action and the new forms of working class collective action mediated through zoom meetings whereby the National Education Union, as we've just heard, had a colossal meeting of nearly half a million, which then enabled collective action of a new sort, which really has saved tens of thousands of lives. Yeah, that's working class power equals public health. And that's really, really clear. And we have a chance to build that working class power. And I mean, what I, so I'm really committed now to, I think, building people before profit because it's just like such a perfect name like if anyone asks what are you about people before profit yeah it's just clear it can be both like a slogan and a hashtag and a mass movement anyone can take it up we can have pensioners before profit students before profit school kids before profit care workers before profit Fleetwood people before profit every yeah we can and we've got to cybernetically link this together we've got to use this moment of the winter of the pandemic exactly as Tina said to discover look we've almost invented our own TV station yeah through these zoom meetings night after night I don't have to watch the uh, the news night 
I can watch trade unionists talking how they're winning victories, like at Barnoldswick, yeah? And like, so this is what I think we've got to do is basically come together and like spread virally. Everyone be a video journalist, videoing the action where they live. We centralize it all, we bring it all together. Anyway, yeah, let's build people before profit and a mass movement and recruit tens of thousands of new trade unionists in their twenties and okay. move on to the climate change. And, and, and as the climate- Larry, can you wind up please? We become people and planet before profit. <laughs> Thank you very much, that's wonderful. Um, Ken. Thank you. Yeah, mine's a sort of a point come question. Um, and it's about the COVID skeptics who've already got zero COVID in their site in their social media posts. Um, they provide a sort of theoretical justification for those people who want to go out and help spread the virus um, because of the way that they think about things. They're often from the far right um, and they've cut stuff that's come, come, come across. Come across from the sorry about that from the United States and Trump. Um, however, there are people involved in this country who come from a libertarian background, an anti-fracking background, who have got used to not believing anything the government requires them to do, and got used to ignoring instructions, and they don't like lockdowns, and so they easily accept some of this stuff and take it on board, sometimes quite uncritically, and. Um, it's difficult to have a debate with them. It, the rage that Tina was talking about is in them, and it's almost become like a cult. And facts and figures don't impress them. They believe a set of facts and figures, which are sometimes have no basis in facts and figures, and they just keep representing them without going back to primary sources. So my question, I suppose, is how do we combat a situation like that when it is in fact infecting, inverted commas, some people who might normally support us? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Eugene next, and then um, Tina. Hi, thanks. Um, First of all, I just want to mention to Kevin, um, we had an NEU meeting last night in uh, Lancaster. It was a very uh, routine meeting, um, just about conference motions and electing delegates to conference and that kind of thing. But at the end of the meeting, we voted to give £200 to the gas workers. Uh, and I've, I've sent that off today. And I just want to say to everybody else, and well, Tina mentioned it as well. She says, what, what do we do? What can this group do to focus on, on, on uh, the thing that we need to fight at the moment? I mean, people have mentioned the Rolls-Royce uh, dispute. We could say like, Lancashire people before profit supported the Rolls-Royce workers and they won. Let's make it that the Lancashire people before profit supported the gas workers and they won. And I think it is important to say that workers are on the, you know, the bosses are on the attack, but workers are winning. So I think also, I've just seen today, the Heathrow workers, similar sort of thing, hire and fire. I think they've managed to put push back the, the bosses at Heathrow. And I think they've called off their strike. I don't know the details, but it looks like they've won. So in other words, when people fight, they can win. And I think that's really important. And I just want to urge people to, you know, show solidarity with British Gas. Um, just picking up on uh, what uh, Andy said, um, obviously I'm a member of the NEU. Um, every day is a battle. I mean, the thing we found out about today was screen time and some teachers are in front of the screen for a lot of time and people are getting, you know, problems with their eyesight. I mean, maybe Janet might know more about this. Uh, what, what is the guidance about uh, health and safety at work in terms of screen time? Because we have had a member contact us today who should have been at our meeting last night and she had a migraine. Um, so the screen time is causing, and it is also causing problems with children as well. I've, I've seen in the, in the, in the paper, the, in the national papers that the, the screen time can cause problems for children's eyesight. So it's like everything you have to fight over. But if you fight over everything, there is a possibility of, of pushing the bosses back. And I just want to finish with this. When they talk about the money, this is, I mean, you might have seen this to people. Jeff Bezos or Bozos, if he gave, it was, I think Oxfam did this. If he gave all his workers, and that's 876,000 workers, um, the amount of $105,000, if he gave 
every single one of his workers $105,000, he would still be better off uh, than he was at the start of the pandemic. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much, Eugene. And just to say that uh, if you go on to the Greater Manchester Hazard Centre website, we have a fact sheet on home working. And it uh, it's goes into all the details about what the display screen equipment legislation says in you know in in making sure that you're you're using the equipment properly and you're getting proper um, uh, time off. It's something like two hours is too long on a computer at one any one time, and there should be regular breaks. But there's a lot more information in there as well that you need to look at. Thanks very uh, much. Just, uh, Tina, you wanted to just come back on something. I do, I wanted to come back on what Ken Criglin was saying about um, you know, how a lot of the skeptics we're seeing, they come from things like the anti-fracking movement. And I have to say, you know, I'm having real issues. I have some very dear close friends who I think have completely lost the plot, but I'm not gonna say that because the next time a fracking site comes up, I've got to stand with them. So I think one of the first things we need to address is to not call each other idiots or Ramonas or COVID idiots. None of that helps because all that's happened is these people have got their information from a different source. They've been raised in a different way. The, the fact that they don't trust what the government is saying makes total sense. It makes total sense to me not to trust the government. It makes no sense for me to trust them, obey them and do what I'm doing right now. But my logic tells me I've studied everything. I follow independent stage. I know we have to do this. But I totally understand why they feel the way they do, because like a conspiracy theory is simply a matter of joining the dots and saying, which is where the opportunism comes in. So if they use this as an opportunity to change laws, to change guidelines, to change contracts, to alter wage agreements and all of that stuff that they're doing, if they do that, at the end of it, it'll be, wow, there, maybe there wasn't a coronavirus. All they did was they created this myth in order to do that. They didn't, it's the other way round. The crisis comes, the opportunists come in, and then you can say later they created that in order to do that. And I get where they're coming from. I understand it. And we have to find a way to be kinder to each other and more tolerant and accepting of knowing that the education in this country sucks most, you know, no offense, but, you know, there's not enough funding in it to have reached the most people and to have given the best standard of education. And certainly we don't teach that sort of critical thinking in the way that we should. And so I think that these people are not bad people they're misled and the, the best way around that and it's hard to keep your temper is to try and find ways that we can unite and say do you trust the government no nor do i find the things we do have in common do you believe this no i don't either but perhaps we can agree around this you know i, I mean i don't know it's, that the word fortunate is right but on the my brother and ex-brother-in-law is a paramedic and became very ill and, and still suffers with long covid since last march and so having experienced the effect of it, it made it very much easier to believe it was real and to know it was real and to see the impact. So yeah, I, I don't agree with them, but I don't think we should, I think we need to find ways to build bridges to them rather than be angry. I think that's right, Tina. And I think, you know, apart from some of them, <laughs> but we, I think we know the ones that we don't want to build bridges with. Uh, Audrey, you wanted to, to speak? Yeah, um, I wanted to um, come back. Well, two things, really. One is I saw in the chat um, a thing about not being able to protest at the uni. Uh, I think it's Bolton uh, because the campus is closed. But what I was thinking, I'm just thinking of small practical things we can do in Lancashire from, the, from what we've heard tonight. Um, and I don't think there's anything, the brilliant thing almost about um, protesting virtually is you don't actually need that many people and all you do need is a camera you don't even need to video it actually you can just um i, th I think previously tina referred to the school dinners the protest over those disgusting boxes that were sent home to people that cost a fiver and the government paid 20 quid for or whatever um th that th that stuff that was sent home the government backtracked because of the number of families that just took fit pictures of of uh, the of the of what was in the box and shoved it on Twitter and Facebook. Um, so I think mass 
mass action by a lot of different people. I don't think necessarily if one poor person puts something on Twitter and everybody likes it, that's great. But it was the fact that there were so many photographs. So anybody questioning the validity, I had it when I shared one on my Facebook and somebody said, is this real, Audrey? Somebody I, you know, would normally trust me. Um, but the, in the end, there were so many of those photographs that, uh, that um, it was absolutely convincing. And I'm thinking, say for Lancaster, um, not necessarily just everybody randomly take, there's nothing to stop us driving up to the, the luckily Lancaster University has got a very long drive. There's nothing to stop us driving up. I know they might get taken down, but um, tying to the lampposts that go up that drive, Lancaster and Morecambe NEU supports the student rent strikers or Lancaster and Morecambe Trade Union Council supports the rent strikers. And also, if you do photograph it, if they do take them down, they can go up on the student rent strikers page or, do you know what I mean? So you can see, you can see that solidarity. And that is just one um, simple thing. And the other thing is, I think maybe where people do take action, maybe we should look at, there are people with the graphic skills um, within our group, um, creating a poster that can be sent out to people, people before profit um, supports, supports um, the gas strikers. And then you can have people, um, during the Black Lives Matter campaign last year, these, the protests, we managed to have socially distanced protests in Lancaster that were huge. Um, but at the set, and they were distanced and they were safe and people wore masks and everything. But obviously a lot of people didn't feel that they could come out of their houses or they were shielding. So we invited people to take the knee on their doorsteps and then they held up Black Lives Matter or they put the posters in the window. And, they, and we, got them, we posted them up at the same time as we posted the photographs of the bigger of the bigger protests, so they were part of the big protest in terms of the the um, social media thing. So there's nothing to stop us also doing, say, a day when we all say we support the gas, gas strikers and we have a virtual rally of solidarity. So just some suggestions. I think that's great. I think there's some really good good ideas there. You know, we've got to look because I mean we've heard a bit about the zero COVID, and we need to to stop the transmission of the virus but how can we virtually how can we maximize our um uh, our our protest at what's going on how do we how do we maximize that and put pressure on the government uh, as well as you know these organizations these employers that are taking advantage of the situation and putting us all at risk don't think there's anybody else that just wants to come back ian did you want to just come back on anything No, I'm cool. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Sunil, did you want to say anything? No, all right. Good, all good, yeah, thanks. Given your all opportunities. Kevin? Yeah, John, just to, to thank everyone who's offered the support on the group here tonight. It's uh, it's just, it, this is the type of support we've been getting. I, I don't think there's been one single dissenting voice, which is rare in, in a dispute, because normally you get, you know, greedy workers get back to work and that. We, we've had none of that. And it's just, just thanks for that. Thanks to the NEU uh, in Lancashire for the uh, for the donation as well. Uh, the strike fund is really growing well, and uh, and we are going to have to tap into it because the amount of um, the amount of strikes that we've got planned going forward run right into April. So it it is going to be a burden on us, but you know we are we are we are uh, we've got the resource to deal with it. So that's all. Jan, thank just you. To, just, just to thank you. And it's been great. To, it's great to have you join us, uh, Gregory. I don't know. If there's anything you wanted to add? Um, well, thank you so much for everyone, uh, their speeches and also for the messages of solidarity. I think to Debs, who was talking about um, University of Bolton, to get started, you could try to sort of um, well speak to people on campus, um, try to get an open let letter written up to the vice chancellor or uni management in general about um, either, you know, a refund or, you know, something like this. And then from there, you can you can build up. Uh, that's essentially what we did. And we were, the, our momentum came from the fact there were so many people who agreed with us and could see a problem. Um, so those are some pointers. But That's thank you great. so much, everyone. Yeah, thanks, Gregory. I mean, if anybody's got any links that they want to send us through that we can post on the Facebook pages, you know, of any of the uh, actions and any and any ideas that you have, then please um, please send them through to you. And lastly, Andy, did you want to say anything to just wind up? Oh. 
I was just going to briefly come back if I could on like this idea of the COVID denial and, and things like that, because I do think it's an issue. You can already see it at the moment um, where there's been a pressure this weekend created around schools because the Tories do run a very good PR machine. I mean, that's what won them the referendum and then the election, wasn't it? Um, so they are very good at it and they've kind of opened up that those battle lines this morning, trying to put pressure um, on other sections of the Tory party uh, to open up before it's safe, really. And I think we've got to be robust. So I do think we need to take on those arguments uh, around people that deny that, that, that COVID exists. I mean, you can literally see the body bags piling up if you go to the right places nowadays. Um, because what it feeds in, it, the more it's around, uh, the more it gives people a license, really, to pick, to pick and choose what they want to do. And we need to be winning the argument that this is a collective effort. Okay, It's not about following rules because I know I, I spend my time reading government rules for stuff around school working and what a safe workplace is they're contradictory and they don't make sense so it's not about following government rules but it is about us saying that collectively we've forced every single uh, safe measure that this government has done has been forced by collective popular power from below and we need to keep each other safe uh, throughout this lockdown through this spring until hopefully um, you know towards the summer if there's no new variants we can kind of start thinking about getting back to normal but we're going to have to do that and to do that we have to win that common sense argument everywhere in every workplace all the time um, around going for a zero covid strategy and about taking on those arguments around people that sort of are covid deniers because all they are doing is letting the government off the hook and allowing people to blame the public, which isn't what is driving this pandemic. Yeah, thanks, uh, Andy. I think we're all endorse that. And, you know, we should be remembering that, you know, some of the people fueling these uh, dissenters are right wing organisations, you know, that are behind them. And they've got their own think tanks and their own organisations that are taking advantage of the situation and trying to stare at problems and you know and get people back to work to unsafe work we're going to have more deaths and absolutely Audrey is there anything else we need to just remember from uh, any of the actions that we need to, need to remind ourselves um, of I think um I think we've covered them because I think people the only other thing I think that we ought to be working on a little bit more is I think and Andy's uh, raised a bit I think this time around, the schools going back for um, key workers and vulnerable children, there are more kids in school than there were last time. And I do think that the government is trying to set teachers and parents and school staff against each other. I think they've done it with that. They're also doing it with the online learning. I mean, last time around, there was no way that people were being expected to teach five lessons a day in front of a screen and do registers points at the end of the lesson and God knows what. Um, I think the other thing is, is that certainly in a, a, one of the reps in one of our schools in, in a poorer area, there's maybe only a, a third, two thirds of the kids actually attending the online lessons. Um, so I think possibly Lancaster, Lancashire, Lancaster, Lancashire people before profit could possibly look at some kind of a meeting around parents and parents and schools together. Um, you know, that feeds it, looking at the free school meals things, because I know schools, I know school staff have been involved in distributing food and helping out with food banks and stuff. Um, and also raising the issues of that, you know, you've got parents who've not been furloughed, but are not working, who've got no money. Um, so the increase in child poverty is huge. Um, so that is just a thought. But I, I imagine that we need to think about what we're doing next. And I, I would like to suggest, and I don't know what the people think, is that we do use the email list and call an activist meeting that's practical, you know, pulling together some of the things from this meeting. It might be that we agree that we're going to make posters to support the gas strikers, that we're going to make posters and act do actions to support the student rent strikers and so on. OK, thank you very much. I think there's some really good ideas there. Um, so thanks very much to our speakers for uh, starting and uh, stimulating that discussion and coming with their ideas and there's, there's some really useful things that have been uh, that we've been talking about and certainly things that have got me thinking about you know what we need to do and I think the idea Audrey of us have an activist meeting would be really useful 
So, uh, so thank you for that. And thank you for everybody for attending. Um, and 